Hello, I'm Stephen Galpin and welcome to Britain, a developing country. In this episode, we're not just going to be looking at developing bricks and mortar, we're looking at some of the bad habits we're developing too. We're going to look at how we're dealing with the effects of sugar on our health, on our culture and on our economy and how our building developments can affect this. I'm going to be talking to three experts in the field who will be helping us understand how to do our utmost to negate the effects of overconsumption of sugar. My first port of call is to Jonathan Joseph, an expert in city regeneration. Jonathan, thank you for inviting us in. Welcome to the show. Thank you. As you know, on our programme, we've been looking at the um, explosion in the, in, in the number of diabetic cases that have, um, that have been found. Growth in the numbers of diabetes, uh, people with diabetes, has been phenomenal for a couple of reasons. Uh, decline in people taking active exercise, um, the uh, availability of um, what is often not great quality food, full of trans fats and sugar, uh, convenience foods, and the quantity of what is in effect very cheap food has really contributed to um, growth in obesity and in diabetes. The two things are linked uh, yeah. inextricably. So, so coming, to, coming back to sort of regeneration, what, what consideration are you finding that planners are, are giving to the placement of fast food shops and, and sort of easy food bars uh, Coffee bars, for instance. I mean, we, we, we've just been in and had just a cup of coffee and something else in one of the more popular coffee shops. And I was just looking at the sort of a, array of cakes and sandwiches. And I mean, I think I'd have really struggled to find anything particularly healthy there. Um, that's a huge problem, but it's a complex problem. But is it being addressed? I don't believe so, not actively. I'm very keen in the work that I'm doing to try and address this, but um, it's uh, the proliferation of cheap fast food shops is also very much a function of the uh, number of people living around who either want or need to be able to shop at that sort of quite cheap level. And um, yeah, I wouldn't say that there's a total correlation between cheap food and not healthy food, but there's a strong correlation. And I think that that is tremendously problematic. It also has been the case that there's a fairly low barrier to entry into that market. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people wanting to start businesses have gone into the cheap fast food market. So there is clearly demand. There are people willing to do it. Uh, you know, be the shopkeeper, work the unsociable hours, supply that sort of food. The raw material is clearly available at a price that enables it to be prepared and sold at reasonable prices. Uh, to get back to it, there's a demographic that is living around um, a lot of town centers and high streets that clearly find the availability of that sort of food not only desirable, but probably essential. Um, and uh, when one talks to local authorities and you talk to the GLA about all this, they are acutely aware of the fact that it's not just a problem of um, five uh, out of 10 shops being fried chicken shops is an aesthetic problem or an aromatic problem. They are very, very clear that this is also an economic problem, a social demographic problem, and uh, that there are no easy solutions. You've got to be very sensitive. Do you find a resistance to, to react to such matters, or, or, or do you find that they're open-minded, the authorities and the developers? The particular local authorities that I've been used to working with over the last number of years is very receptive to change. The councillors are usually from uh, across the whole political spectrum. Mm. They see a lot of different social problems in their surgeries. And uh, they're very, very keen that we don't create a sort of one-size-fits-all aesthetic that uh, 
you know, might appeal to me, but ain't necessarily going to appeal to somebody who is on low income, zero contract hours, living five minutes away from the high street. I mean, it, it, it's quite a difficult subject. I mean, one can, one can see quite easily with the power of television advertising, for instance. So let's take young single mum with a couple of kids, you know, and she sees on the TV that you can get a burger and a shake and a great big bag of chips for a quid or whatever it is. What are you going to do? Because there's not much you can buy in the supermarket for a pound, you know. Again, I do, I do worry about the government. The same, I have the same view of, of the housing market. Whenever the government get involved, I think, oh no, it's just going to be a sort of tinkering around the edges of various things. I think these sugar taxes and things, I, I'm, I'm not really sure how much real effect they have across the board. And I mean, again, the, the retail outlets. I was in a supermarket the other day. I have to watch my sugar. So I picked up this particular energy bar, whatever it was called. I looked at the sugar and I thought, wow, that's low. And then I read on and it said, per bite. <laughs> and I thought, do you know? <laughs> that's, I've never... <laughs> I've never read far enough down yeah, any of those yeah, things well, to pick that up. I, 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 was, I, was, I sort of almost dropped it as if it was on fire. I will, I will now. <laughs> yes. One of the charities most active in type 1 diabetes research is JDRF. I went to their London offices and met with Michael Connellan to find out more about what they're doing in this field. But first of all, let's find out what the first signs of type 1 diabetes actually are. Well, type 1 and type 2, they're both very serious conditions. And with type 1 diabetes, it can be swiftly life-threatening if, if those symptoms aren't spotted. So thank you for asking. The symptoms can vary from person to person, but classically, they are similar to type 2. They're the four Ts, as they're called. So it's going to the toilet more often. It's um, having a insatiable thirst. It's losing some weight, being thinner, teeth are thinner. And also it's feeling uh, feeling exhausted, feeling tired. Okay, I see. So let's have a think. So we go back to the beginning of the journey. Mum and Dad spot these symptoms, take the youngster along to the doctors. What happens from there? Well, as you say, as you hint, type 1 diabetes is classically diagnosed in childhood or young adulthood, although it can develop in anyone at any age. And if those symptoms are spotted, then the individual with the condition needs to be moved on to an insulin regime as soon as possible. They need to be moved on to that urgently because they need insulin to stay alive every day for the rest of their life. So we spotted the symptoms, we've gone to the doctor, insulin is diagnosed as being needed and um, essential if you like to, to uh, future life. Um, what, what sort of lifestyle changes would one introduce? Well with type 1 diabetes it's important to flag that there, there are no lifestyle choices you can make to avoid the condition developing in your body. Um, you cannot um, eat a better diet, leave a, uh, live a more ideal lifestyle to avoid this condition. There's no way to avoid type 1 at all. Um, once you develop the condition, it is demanding. You do have to self-manage this complex condition where you need to do finger prick blood tests multiple times a day to find out what's happening with your blood glucose levels. You then need to inject a corresponding amount of insulin at the right times to manage your conditions. And that has a big impact on the individual and on the wider family. Now, tell me, you talk about calculations and it being difficult to balance the amount of insulin needed. Mm. Who, who's going to do those calculations? Well, ultimately, the individual has to go home and the individual has to do that themselves and that's tough that's really really demanding and difficult and if it's a three-year-old child diagnosed then that's incredibly demanding on the on the parents and on the family I mean that's just the picture I have of a young child one you've got to inject that child with a needle and, and, and pump the insulin in and also the, the perhaps the discipline that's needed is, is going to be very difficult to uh, to keep control of isn't it really yeah indeed with that thing finger prick blood test, you're talking about sticking steel in your own body or in your own small child's body. It's, um, it's a, a daily painful nuisance at best. It's incredibly important to recognise that technology is actively helping us in the fight against diabetes. Let's be glad that progress is actually being made.
Now, just talking on about um, about recognising the levels of blood sugar and, and, and um, keeping control of that. I mean, technology is now coming into this. We've got Freestyle Libra, which is a, a, a non-injection way of taking Trip. taking the reading. Um, I was reading um, some time ago that uh, what one of the leading um, electronic watchmakers is doing something that will allow that wristwatch to tell us whether we've got diabetes in the future or, or, or not. So what are the sort of technical innovations you're seeing in your research? Well, it's an exciting time. As you say, there are these new wearable medical technologies that are coming through that will begin to free patients from the regime of the finger prick blood test and the injection via insulin pen. There are now um, insulin pumps. There are these as you say, the wearable technology where you can scan yourself in a contactless way to find out that blood glucose level. And also JDRF is funding research into perfecting the artificial pancreas. This is in advanced human trials, and this is allowing an insulin pump and a continuous glucose monitor to talk to each other, to talk to themselves via an algorithm. And that will allow someone to plug that onto their body and just forget about their so, condition so, for a so while. So effectively you're, you're planting um, inner, inner organs on the outside then? Yeah, we, we are and we want to progressively reduce the impact of this condition until we find the cure and wearable medical technology is a huge part of that now, for us. What, what about cost? I know Freestyle Libra um, does have a significant monthly cost for the test patches and if these watches come along they're going to be um, I would imagine not cheap, let's put it that way. And of course your, your um, pancreas, your external pancreas, is, is also no doubt going to be expensive, is it not? There's a cost to medical technology. There are greater costs that need to be offset in terms of the complications that would need to be treated long term on the NHS if we, are not, if we fail to provide these, these medical technologies early on. JDRF, as the Type 1 Diabetes Charity, we lobby, we campaign with our partner charities to win access to these technologies on the NHS for people affected by Type 1 Diabetes. So, we recognise that there's a problem, but just how big is the problem? I asked Dr Peter Hinmarsh, a paediatrics doctor who specialises in juvenile diabetes. So the numbers have been increasing over the uh, last uh, decade or so, and it's in both aspects, the type 1, which is more the childhood diabetes, which is needing insulin as its treatment, and also in the type two, which is more classic adult one, where you have dietary manipulation to try and control the situation. And that's been creeping gradually backwards into childhood. So 20 years ago, it was pretty unusual to have a young person with type two diabetes. Now we're up to about 700, 800 individuals in the United Kingdom. So it's not huge yet, but it's an appreciable step change. Well, I, I, I think back to my days as a youth and I mean in those days healthy eating and really self-care was, was very low on the agenda. So is it the fact that we're just identifying this problem now more um, or, or, or is it increasing in itself? I mean, it's a good point because there is clearly uh, more of a drive to trying to identify these things earlier because by the time people often presented in the past they developed lots of complications and problems already by the time uh, they were diagnosed. So there is probably an element of earlier diagnosis. There's probably uh, an increase in diagnosing things before you've actually got major problems with mm -hmm. glucose. That aside though, um, there is probably something else happening in society or the environment so the gene pool, if you like, is probably not changed that much um, in terms of predisposition to type 2 diabetes. What probably has happened is that the environment's changed quite a bit in terms of access, as you say, to more easily available um, rapid-acting carbohydrate. For the benefit of our viewers, I wonder if you could just very quickly um, explain in simple form 
the difference between type 1 and type 2 because the thing that's just confusing me a little bit is that we're, we're told as we, as we get older we need to have a, a better lifestyle in terms of eating and consideration of the food that we take. If we don't, we'll become pre-diabetic and move on to type 2 diabetes. But what you seem to be referring to is that type 1 diabetes takes hold immediately as, as you're a child. Yes, yes, I mean, I mean the, the type, type 1 diabetes, diabetes is, is where, where the, the body's body turned against the insulin-producing cells in the pancreas, destroy them. Yeah. You've got no insulin. Yeah. So you need insulin replacement therapy. And there's no way a tablet can just encourage no, that? No, no right. sad, sadly not, no. Classically, that's got its onset in childhood. So there's two peaks, one around about seven years of age and the other around about 12, 13 years of age. And then as you go into uh, adulthood, you can still get type 1, but the older you get, the, the chances of it happening are lessened. Whereas the type 2, which is a combination of a problem in the cells producing insulin, but also the body is becoming more resistant to the action of insulin as time is going on. And in that situation, your first line of therapy is to reduce your glucose intake, so that's a, a dietary approach. And then the second line is the oral medications, which uh, you just alluded to. In my opinion, there definitely seems to be a link between lifestyle and type 2 diabetes. I asked Michael Connellan and Peter Hinmarsh, two highly qualified professionals, for their views. Part of our uh, investigations on, on, on this diabetes subject have shown and been confirmed by a number of specialists that certainly in the case of type 2, that it, the, the economic situations for families have a bearing on this. So one professional put it to me that in America that threshold is $12,000. If you're below $12,000, chances are you're going to be in the line to get type 2 diabetes because your quality of food, the type of food that you eat, is, is not going to be attractive for the body. Are, are such considerations applicable to type 1? Well, there are implications with type 1 you know, you can't avoid the condition by getting that lifestyle, that, that diet perfect, but the previous government, they brought in the sugar tax um, under the, the Cameron government, and that, that had some concerns for the type 1 diabetes community because the soft drinks manufacturers were changing sugar levels in their drinks in response to that. Now, if you have a hypo, if, um, if you have type 1 diabetes, you need immediate swift action to sugar. You need that medically. And so you need to get that fizzy drink into your system. You need a jelly baby. And the fact that recipes were changing, the fact that people had to grab their hypo treatment from, from the shop and they may have to drink a different amount of the liquid, that potentially had an impact on their ability just to get better from that hypo swiftly. And some doctors and nurses were concerned about that. Okay. I mean, I, I, I have to say that from a real estate point of view, you know, we've heard a lot about the high street being in trouble and all sorts of changes happening on the high street. But the good news is the people involved in regeneration that we've talked to have said that Town councils now are particularly strong on not allowing too many fast food outlets in one particular area, keeping them away from schools, and all these sort of considerations are now coming in. But again, I guess this is not really um, something that's going to help um, type 1 sufferers, is it? It's not, and we believe at, at the Type 1 Diabetes Charity JDRF, we believe it's important to avoid a, a, a blame culture accidentally being created when public health initiatives are being created. If you know, local councils want to, want to collaborate on um, opportunities to make British lifestyle healthier, then fantastic. That could potentially have a positive impact on uh, heart disease, on type 2 diabetes and things like that, but we need to make sure that there aren't unintended consequences from such, such measures. Let's talk for a moment about um, the prevalence of, of, of diabetes in uh, certain social categories, mm. if you like. I mean, for, for instance, we're filming here in Canary Wharf today. Mm. Um, anybody that knows the geography here is that we on one side of um, the island here we have high density, high rise, ultra expensive properties. On the other side of the island we have certainly less developed areas, higher density of 
fairly low grade housing. Mm -hmm. Would you expect to see a difference in those two areas in the levels of diabetes? In other words, is it directly linked to lifestyle and wealth? Well, certainly the type two story um, has a link to um, income and, and deprivation because they often go hand in hand. Uh, you can see that very nicely in the United States uh, where there's always been this story about a higher a prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the Afro-American uh, population and the Hispanics. Actually, if you start breaking it down, the difference disappears. And the actual magic point is that if you earn less than $12,000 a year, you're going to develop obesity and type 1 diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes. And do, you, do you feel that happens in this country too? Is it uh, so obvious? I think it probably is uh, obvious. We're pretty good at recording um, deprivation and um, income status in the, in, in the United Kingdom, and, and, and certainly obesity tracks in that direction. Uh, there's no doubt about that. It's just the forerunner of type two. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's a rather strange uh, paradox that obesity is a disease of relative poverty in an environment of affluence. So if you go to Vietnam, everybody's thin. End of discussion. Right. Yes. <laughs> but uh, as soon as you start bringing in um, either industrial or, or post-industrialized models, then your um, obesity rates start to rise. Do you, do you see that on a day-to-day -day basis in your practice? Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it cuts across both type one and type two uh, in the sense of uh, the, 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 those factors are still operative um, uh, and, you know, yeah, of course, we do try to reduce the inequalities as best we can, um, in, certainly in type one, in terms of access to care. Um, uh, but it is there very clearly, um, in, in our practice anyway. If diabetes is becoming as prevalent as it seems, what should parents look out for? I suppose one of the problems is, for parents in particular, is that Diabetes is not necessarily that obvious, is it? You've got, you know, no no bleeding hands or, yeah. or, or, or pains yeah. in the stomach or yeah. headaches or, yeah. or, or whatever else. Yeah. So what must a parent look for? So, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. It's quite insidious. And um, what parents are going to need to look out for are essentially increase in going to the toilet, weeing, mm -hmm. increase in thirst, Increase in appetite as well because you're essentially losing calories in your urine because you know, the glucose is just going straight through and tiredness. You could argue and say, well, uh, actually, what we're asking people to do in terms of regulate, uh, keeping an eye on carbohydrate intake, a more healthy eating agenda is no different to what we would say to everybody else. Um, it's just that it's more obvious in this situation where uh, glucose has got such a, a key uh, role uh, to play. What we've learned over the time though, is that it, 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 there's no point in corralling people into some sort of uh, uh, regiment to sort of you know, strictly go down a certain line. You've got to fit the family. Against it, the exactly, yeah. So you've got to fit the diabetes around them rather than the other way around. And if you do that and appreciate their particular unique points as a family, then you, you're more likely to sort of get engagement. So, is it all doom and gloom? I think not. If we use common sense and wait for the effect that advances in technology will bring, there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's, it's complex. Uh, with, with type 1 diabetes, there's no way to avoid it. But with type 2, like type 1, you have to be genetically predisposed. Some people are so genetically predisposed that there is no way to avoid that type 2 diagnosis, even with really great diet, really great lifestyle. So as we explore as a country how to get the public health right through development, through all those kind of arenas, it's important just to avoid any assumptions about blame, any assumptions about causality. Do you think that epidemic is simply because we are doing more screening or whether the numbers have genuinely gone up over the years? Well, with type 1 diabetes, it, it doesn't 
linger hidden in the body for a large amount of time, people will swiftly fall ill. With type 2 diabetes, I'm aware there have been public road shows and greater awareness has led to um, a greater level of, of diagnosis. With, with type 2, it, 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 it can be hidden uh, for, for a while. But with type 1, there's evidence from Germany that if we potentially invest in a, in a wider public screening program, then we can identify those at risk and help those get, be ready to spot those symptoms as soon as type 1 does, does manifest. What about some golden rules for parents who suddenly think their little ones have got diabetes or are showing the... Right. Um... Okay, well, I think the, 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 the big one is get seen promptly um, and get a very simple urine test done. Um, yeah, you can check it on blood as well, but first go, but whatever you do, just get seen. And if the least you get done is a urine test, that's, that's a great start. And we'd rather see people right early on than after than later on. Than <laughs> later on, yeah. yeah okay. It, well, the ultimate aim is to find that cure. We want to eradicate type 1 diabetes. So we're looking into different research areas, for example, immunotherapy, where we are looking at the fact that type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition, where instead of the body correctly identifying those viruses and killing them, the immune system is misfiring and it's killing the ins in insulin producing cells that we need. So we're looking via immunotherapies whether we can retrain or reset that immune condition to turn off that faulty, that faulty impulse. And also we're looking at whether stem cell research can allow us to grow insulin producing cells in the lab and the exciting news is that Doug Melton in the States has find, found a way to create these insulin producing cells in, in, in large numbers in, in the lab so we can now explore how to return those to the body. That would be another side of a cure for the condition. Michael Connolly, thank you so much. Thank you to um, JDRF for inviting us in this morning. Sounds like you're doing some amazing work and we wish you all the best with that. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So that's all we have time for in this programme. Join me next time. Britain, a developing country.